This is Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with two very enterprising young individuals. Are from the rethinking economics world, but they have decided to take us beyond understanding what's wrong and start to direct us towards what's right in the future of economics. There are a lot of things, there are a lot of dilemmas to explore. Their forthcoming book, Economic Studies, A New Vision for Economics Education, comes out in October of this year. I want to encourage you to read it. I've had a chance to look at the, uh, the galleys. My friend and, how would I say, a great illuminator of economics, Martin Wolf wrote a preface. He's very enthusiastic when we've talked. My Young Scholars Initiative is very enthusiastic. So guys, thanks for joining me. This is a delight to be able to explore with you here today. Thanks for inviting us. Yeah, thanks. So let's start with what you might call the, the origins, the history, the inspiration. What did you guys see? What inspired you? What was your diagnosis of what was needed? that set you on in motion on this path and to where this book is going? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so we, we come from the Rethinking Economics Movement, um, which is, for those who don't know, a big international student movement to uh, change economics education, uh, to, to bring it into the 21st century, you might say. And what we noticed in the rethinking movement, we've done a lot of critiquing of existing programs. So there's been tons of curriculum research mapping what is being taught today, what are the main textbooks, what are the main theories. Uh, and we found that we did a research like that in the Netherlands as well, where we live close to Amsterdam. Um, and we found that if we take that to the to the faculty, to the economics professors, a lot of them will say, okay, you know, you've, you've got some good points. Uh, so, so what then? What do you want? W what would you like us to teach? And we'd come up and say, you know, we want more uh, pluralist theory, more pluralist methods, more real-world economics. But it remained a little bit vague, a little bit abstract. And especially if you've been teaching more or less the same material over the past 20, 30 years, of course, updated now and then, but the same basics, it's really hard to think outside the box. It's really hard to, to step completely away from all that material and imagine something new. And that's the void we wanted to fill with this book, to, to give people the building blocks to really redesign the economics education. Okay. Well, Sam, you know, how would I say, I love blues music. And rewriting the interpretation of blues music might be a delight for me. But I remember the epigraph of your manuscript, which said, I do not care who writes a nation's laws if I can write the economics textbook. That was one of my former teachers at MIT, Paul Samuelson. But what he's talking about is how important getting it right is, how influential it is in the structure, outcomes, experience of our lifetime and our society. When you look at this notion of pluralism, can you can you just zoom in on that for me a minute? What do you mean by pluralism? Yeah, sure, sure. And I think think for me it would be a, a pluralism of hip hop. Uh, that's that's my kind of music. <laughs> <laughs> Making it myself as well. Um, I mean, with yes, a name you... like Robert Johnson, you got to forgive me for liking the blues, right? <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> and I like the blues as well, but. <laughs> um, but yes, indeed, the, the, the motivation also for us in, in, in this book and, in, and being a part of Rethinking Economics is, is not so much of changing our personal education. Uh, when I became a student at university, I was frustrated myself and I thought I want something else uh, from, from the courses I got. But obviously, that's not the end goal. Uh, I'm graduated by now, so, so also my own sort of economics education uh, is, is finished for now. Um, but the goal is really the next generation of economists to prepare them for their future roles because, yeah, the world is pretty much 
often, unfortunately, as well, on fire. Um, and, and, and there are many, like the, the biggest world challenges that we have today, economics and the economic challenges are core part of them, whether it's the coronavirus right now or whether it's climate change or whether it's growing inequality. A lot of these issues, economics is a huge part of it. And what we feel is that currently the economics education doesn't really prepare students for their future roles to really tackle these these wicked problems that they are. Um, so we, we are really afraid that, um, yeah, often the example is, is given of, of the financial crisis 10 years ago of what can happen once economists are not well prepared uh, in terms of their thinking, in terms of their habits of research uh, for a world challenge like that. So we really want to make sure that in the future this becomes better and that's the core motivation for this book. Uh, and pluralism is, is a key aspect of this where we think it's um, important that as economists we are able to use different perspectives. So once a challenge comes to us, we are able to look at it from one perspective and from another. So when we, for example, think about climate change, uh, we can think from it from a neoclassical point of view and think about the externalities and how these should be priced and costing, whether it's a carbon price or an emission trading scheme. And this is a very valuable insight and perspective to use. But it is not the only perspective we should have. So we should, for example, also think about the more planetary boundaries, which ecological economics often emphasizes that actually it's not just a cost that is incremental, but at some point there is just a boundary. Uh, where, whether we think of the circular economy and resources, for example, this is a useful uh, way of thinking, but also you thinking about evolutionary economics, like how do sectors evolve, how do new technologies emerge, and how can we make sure that the green technologies emerge in the future, which is a different way of thinking and just helps us as economists challenge or tackle all these challenges. Um, so we think that pluralism is really just an approach where you are openly asking a question like, how can I tackle this issue and are willing to explore different answers to that question. And the, uh, how would I say, using the history of economic thought, there's obviously Marxism, neoclassical economics, some of the institutional economics, Thorstein Veblen, people of that nature. There's the Cambridge England Keynesian system, Luigi Passanetti and others. I mean, what I find, there, there are a few scholars like Steve Marglin, who's at Harvard University, who have integrated these into books and presented courses which create what you might call comparative uh, perspectives around a particular issue. You pick a real world issue and we'll, we'll bring all these things to bear. What I think unnerves some people is it leaves you with a set of dilemmas rather than with a sense of certainty. But that false comfort may be very dangerous. So I, I think your yeah. pluralistic exploration means you got to honestly earn your confidence you can't create a false confidence or a coercive confidence uh, through, you know, test curriculum and as learning a subset. But when you talk about, uh, I think I recall three things, pluralism, real world and values. We'll say real world is you're not studying some fictitious model. You're studying the planet, its challenges. It, it, there's a purpose here. But where do the values come in? I mean, uh, how would I say yours? What, what's your thought? Where did you? Why did you bring values to the table? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question, and I think this is this is one that uh, arises for a lot of, let's say, mainstream economists, um, because most of the economists that that taught me uh, and most that I know say, you know, economics. Is a positive science, and there's also the normative side, and that's for politicians and citizens and philosophers. public debate philosophers. <laughs> yeah, um, and economists, in this view, are uh, technical people who do, let's say, the, the calculating um, and and no, and don't go into values. and And we think that this is a false distinction. So we think it's good. That economists don't don't secretly jump on the uh, you know sneak onto the uh, the chair of the politician and and try to uh, put their values into the research or uh, you know say say you are quite a, a leftist economist that, that you try to let that 
come out of your research. Um, economists should try to be politically neutral, but it's impossible to be politically neutral if you don't have attention for values, if you don't learn to discuss values and, and put them above the table and say, okay, you know, we have this, this problem of rising unemployment. Um, what different values are at stake? Uh, you know, what, what social values, what uh, geopolitical values, what's, what's at stake here? And, and uh, how do different solutions that are being proposed to the problem at hand affect those different values? And if you, if you teach uh, young upcoming economists to to actively discuss this with each other. Uh, they they have the chance to learn a language for this and to uh, to then also effectively present this to either politicians or the general public, um, rather than leaving the values that are embedded in a lot of theories, also neoclassical. Their their values embedded uh, and leaving them unspoken is is a very dangerous thing. We think. Yeah, maybe shortly adding on that, I think the the aim to be as objective as, as you can, as I think we, we wholeheartedly embrace. Yeah. But indeed, the reality is that in, in practice, it's often impossible to be completely objective uh, and completely neutral and, and recognizing that and allowing students and enabling them to talk about it in a, in a sophisticated, meaningful way. Uh, and also informing others, because as economists, we are often advisors to politicians, to businessmen, to bankers, uh, and being able to, to explain to them what is the moral dilemma in this situation that we are in or for this issue. Um, because we should know the details of the economic cases, so we should also be able to explain the moral issues and normative questions that, that arise from them. Yeah, I want to... Uh add a little bit to perhaps why we got into this place that you're resisting. Hmm. When once uh, we did a conference in 2017 in Edinburgh, Scotland, and in the year and a half leading up to that, I spent a lot of time consulting everybody who knew a lot about the history of Adam Smith, David Hume, and others from the Scottish Enlightenment. My mother's maiden name is Douglas. She's from Scotland, so they gave me a little extra fuel. But when I got into it, one of the things that I really learned from some of the dialogue that surrounded Adam Smith, including some of his own, was there was a tremendous feeling in a time of feudalism that the state and the church were being corrupted by the feudal lords and that moral discourse from say, you know, Protestant revolution or Protestant reformation, excuse me, and various different others was viewed as corrupted. So if you wanted to go to work, and now the Industrial Revolution is a challenge to the structure of power relative to the landed aristocracy, but if you wanted to go to work in the government, you did not continue to use the language of moral discourse because it disqualified you as probably being party to corruption. So scientific value-free technocracy becomes the, uh, how do I say, language of the day for those who were to be put into office or into positions of influence. The second frame, and uh, I'll speak of a man who I have great admiration for, I've worked with just a little bit, named David Collender, who I know you've cited in your book, was I once said to him, Somebody called me and said, why would you want to be an economist? Everybody reads the paper. Everybody thinks they're an economist. So how do you discriminate between what really is an economist and what's not? And I thought that, you know, David, David was very lucid in saying, yeah, a whole lot of people get whipped up in emotion and, the, you know, fashion of the day and this and that. And an economist has to be at a little more what I'll call distance, reflective, dispassionate, deeper. It, it didn't mean not history of economic thought. It didn't mean not values. But he was essentially saying there's a real problem with the signal to noise ratio when everybody thinks they're an economist. So what what makes what makes you value added? And so I I think some of the tension about bringing values in relates historically to the echoes of the corruption of the Christian church 
in late feudalism and also to the rough and tumble of political discourse now. And, and you may be right that people downstream and politicians and whoever can fight about whatever they want. But where is the North Star? Where is the guidance system? But as we've talked about already, providing them a false one doesn't help. No, exactly. Um, and I mean, I, I, I like the background you put on this. And, and um, I think I, I agree with this danger. If you if you bring in values in the way that you let's assume you teach students, you know, the, these these are the right values to have. That would be wrong. We, we would be absolutely dead set against that. But in fact, this is also how this point values ties into the earlier point of pluralism. If you teach people only one way to think, and it's a broad way, it, it, it includes several subtools, but it's, it's only one way to think, uh, there's a danger that they'll mistake the map for the territory. Um, so, for example, if you teach people to, to think only about uh, market mechanisms and not, not, not just perfect, ma perfect market mechanisms, but also you know, market breakdown, then the only solution people will have is one where you consider everyone as an individual consumer uh, and where you see only markets as, as, as the only possible arrangement in an economic question. And, and that's where, where the values are also creeping in, but under the table in in a dangerous way and we say no that value is there anyway put it above the table and put different different perspectives beside it so that students will will be able to really tell the difference and and tell which part of what they're seeing is their tool uh, and which part is the reality yeah one of my friends used an analogy uh he said it's like when they teach you economics in the sense that you've been critiquing It's like being on the Titanic. All of the values consciousness is kept down in the bilge, in the hold. It's not brought on deck to discuss. <laughs> and that's why you hit the rock or hit the ice. <laughs> you hit the iceberg. But when you bring it up on deck, people learn how to change course. It may be yeah. not, to the, not to please the powerful at a moment in time. But it's yeah. it's respectful. Now, I, I want to bring something to this uh, because I'm, I'm really enthusiastic about what you're doing. And some might say it's just opening a can of worms. But here's the, here's the other side of this. We call these things democracies. I work with this group, Scolas Ocarantes, who's uh, been working with now Pope Francis for many, many years. And they are concerned that many people don't go to college around the world. But then they're asked to participate in governance, learn how to have faith and expertise and other things. And they are concerned that a what you might call top ground, and I won't call it education, indoctrination is alienating. Something that avoids the dilemmas of power is uh, sterile. And then people drop out of school. They say, I'd rather go get a wage, help my family, particularly in the global south, than Put up with this stuff, which is irrelevant. And what that group has often talked about is what I will call, this is an American analogy, econo-civics. We used to be taught civics about the institutions of governance and the American founding fathers and principles and how it evolved to, you know, U.S. Treasury, Federal Reserve System, Environmental Protection Agency. The idea that people, even 15 to 18 years old, should be taught how these things called corporations or government agencies or cryptocurrency affect your life will maintain their curiosity. And the way to figure out their curiosity is to go ask them what they want to learn, not tell them what they will learn, which runs the risk of alienation. So I think you're bringing everything back up on the table, values, etc., is going to generate much greater interests in economics uh, from the from so. the 15 to you know tenured professor yeah, we and hope so and and this is also when uh, when we discuss the the third principle so we, we mentioned pluralism and values and then real world is the third one in a row yes. and when we discuss that 
so, something a lot of professors say, understandably, is, you know, we don't have time for that. We, we have only a brief period, and, and the same applies to secondary school level. We don't have time, they say. We have only a brief, brief period to teach these people. And they can read the newspaper in their own time and, and do even economic history. It's, it's you know, attractive enough to read, uh, uh, buy a book and read it in your evening, but they'll never do the mathematics on their own. And in a sense, we completely understand, but we think that this is a false dichotomy because if you, if you trigger people with knowledge of the actual economic system around them. And if you trigger people with actual economic challenges and knowledge of existing economic sectors and, and how, they, how they grew and how, how they declined or imploded, the, the interest for all the other stuff and also the dry, you know, uh, quote unquote dry theoretical stuff, it, it stops being dry, it becomes lively and, and, and it becomes fascinating. So, so we think that if you invest in teaching people real world knowledge about the economy, it, it triggers so much more interest and so much more uh, citizen participation throughout life uh, and, and engagement. And yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. It's, it's, it's a counter to this kind of alienation that we're seeing today. Yeah. And it, and it also helps just real understanding uh, because being able to link it to something that happens around you or in your personal life sort of helps you to really understand what the model and the equation might mean uh, because otherwise it's just a simple exercise of remembering the equation and then you do the math but then you have no clue what it would mean in terms of an economic process or uh, phenomenon. Yes, I, I'll attest to that. In our preparation, we talked a little bit about my background when I was a young boy, my father was a championship racing sailor. I wanted to be good like him. I went and taught myself meteorology, trigonometry for navigation, aerodynamics, hydrodynamics was calculus. The math was a tool with a goal. The tools are a means to an end. The end is what is, you know, your passion, your heart, what you want to do. When I got to college, I walk in my first economics course, and the guy starts talking about equilibrium. I grew up in Detroit, Michigan. That's like growing up in a cauldron. And in the, this is the 60s, 70s to the early 80s. And I said, equilibrium. I raised my hand. I wasn't trying to be a smart aleck. I raised my hand. I said, isn't that like assuming a happy ending? Because <laughs> it, it, was just, it was just like, uh, you know, yeah. how would I say? I was kind of aghast. Because the real world I was observing didn't feel like what you might call the closure that those models brought to the table made, made much sense, and, uh, or at least in the time frame that I was familiar with. But I think, uh, obviously, these economic issues are very important. Another, another one I want to ask you both about. When you read the existing economics texts, there's a notion we might call public goods and externalities. It almost feels to me like we do so much energy in introductory economics of teaching people almost to worship markets that we're not asking how pervasive are externalities. And do the textbooks bring, you know, more and more, Wendy Carlin and uh, Sam Bowles core and other books are now bringing the challenges, the environment, etc., to the table. But don't don't we have to ask, in light of your real world vision, how sufficient are markets as a deity to defer to? And for that matter, to take it over to the left side of the spectrum, when political economy is not separable, markets and politics, the role of money politics, as Tom Ferguson, who's my research director, who I know you credited in your early notes in the book, who thinks that you can just trust government? There's all kinds of evidence in the United States in Gallup polls and stuff going back through the Obama administration that said, we don't trust government anymore among people from the left. I think we're facing a dilemma about what's the challenge and what can you trust and what's the real model of how all these processes, including markets and governance, work. 
And it's not like the old days of, you know, communism is an ideal or free market capitalism is an ideal. Everybody's got warts. It's very difficult to, uh, to, to be dogmatic in light of what we can see right before our eyes. Yeah. Yeah, I think I, I fully agree. And I think with, with in the book, we, we indeed really, uh, one, one thing we really try to address is, is this focus right now on markets. It's, it's, if you want to understand the real world and you just look around you, there is a lot more than just markets. So we also have this quote from Ha Jung Cheng, uh, that the economy is much larger than, than the market. Uh, and this, 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 there is a normative aspect to the dis this debate as whether it should be all about the market, but there is also just the practical. Uh, for example, today I, I cooked a lunch for Joris. I didn't ask him to pay money for this in terms of a market exchange. <laughs> this was more reciprocity as being a friend. So it's, but it's also an economic relationship and, and process that is going on here. And, and this happens all the time. But in our economics education, we, we often don't talk about it. So we learn not to think about it. Uh, so we sort of become blind to large parts of our economy. And we think this is really not helpful for whatever political preferences you have, it's not helpful to sort of ignore a large part of the economy. Uh, and this is just one example, but yeah. obviously there, there are many more with Creative Commons online, with Wikipedia. There, these are different kinds of ways of organizing the economy. So we say before debating also the, the normative, the policy debates, just start with giving students some basic knowledge. So what economic organi organizational forms are there? can have a corporation, a family firm, a small firm, a stock traded firm, a public institution like a school, what exists and, and what kind of economic mechanisms are there, hierarchy, commons, markets, all this reciprocity, all these different things and really have an idea of the sort of diversity of options that there are in the world. And I think that, at least for me, learning about all these different things indeed made me far less like simplistically thinking, so one is the best thing we should do everything by one, because if you look around, there is so much going on there. So I think we can, as economists, become way more sophisticated in our policy thinking and advice as well, thinking creatively yeah. about how to combine and what mix, in what situation, what works best. Yeah, I want to add something to this. So, so we have in the book 10 building blocks where we say these are areas of knowledge or skills that any economist should have a little bit from each of the 10 blocks at least in different proportions for different audiences. Uh, and one building block is economic organizations and mechanisms, which speaks to what Sam just discussed. And when we were writing that, we were thinking, okay, you know, what, what different types of organizations do you have? What different types of commercial firms? What different type of non-profits, organizations, and so on? And we basically tried to do what biologists would call uh, a taxonomy of the economic system. What different kinds of animals and plants do you find in the economic system? And... This was really, it was really hard to find suitable material to teach this with. It was surprisingly difficult to find uh, economic writing which had structured this multitude of organizational forms and economic mechanisms into a comprehensive, comprehensible matrix. So, so, so actually to, en to any listeners out there, if you know of good work in this area, uh, which, which teaches to students in, in a comprehensible way the matrix of different types of organizational forms, you know, please reach out because uh, we haven't been able to find something good in that area. I mean, we have some, some, some things. Some, some stuff, <laughs> definitely, but, but it's surprisingly yeah. sparse. Yeah. 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 Well, my uh, colleague Gonzalo, who I know is a friend of yours, uh, said to me that he, he took your 10 categories from the book and he said, I think there are five things going on. One is kind of an introduction to the challenge. Second is looking at history, both of the economy and of ideas. Third is what are the concepts around understanding contemporary organization, then analysis, including data related and analysis. And finally, what's your contribution to the world if you want to be an economist? Why are you doing this stuff? And I think that I think all of these elements are very, very, um, how would I say, important. And I want to, I, I want to kind of, we've been talking about your inspiration and a lot of what's going on in what you're trying to build. But I want to, I want to focus on two things. First is what, 
does the change in the profession look like if we adopt your way of teaching economics and building economists? Because as I uh, referenced David Collender's thinking, if you're, if you're, how would I say, not very good at anything, but exposed to everything, what are you adding? And it's, that's, that's a tension. Uh, but if you're only narrowly focused, you're missing everything that's going on and it's just flying by and, you, and you're irrelevant. So I don't, and a lot of people think, you know, a lot of the high-end game theorists and all that are beautiful, formal, you know, they're, they're like during the 30 years war being up in the monastery talking in code, but avoiding the controversy. And so I, I find it very difficult to understand when I try to project, what are people hiring? What are people tenuring? What are people doing if you're vision of economics is adopted. And then uh, I'll come back to, let's address some of the current problems from an economist like you're envisioning in contrast to the economists we have, financial reform, climate change, and things like that. But let's start with what does the profession look like? What does an economist look like who's, how do they say, adopted and evolved through the vision that you impart? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think I think the first thing to say is is in our vision there there are a lot of different kinds of economists. Uh, so so there is not just one program. Uh, we when we started writing the book, the initial idea was to write this one perfect curriculum, uh, and we very quickly found out there is no such thing as the perfect curriculum that is perfect everywhere. And uh, because there are always different options and specialities to, that you can choose. So, so what, we, what we really advocate is actually that different programs can also tailor to different kinds of skills. So for example, right now, if, if you are not good at mathematics, but you are really good at doing interviews and qualitative research, it's really difficult to become an economist, especially a high ranked economist. But we think that these kind of economists could add a lot of insight into how the economy works and, and our research. So what we would argue for is not that there should be no econometrician. There should still be someone really good at econometrics. But next to that kind of an economist, there should also be someone who is really good at doing interviews, understanding the institutions, the relationships between different actors. So in practice, that would mean that different programs could, for example, focus on different things. So rather than in the Netherlands, over the last years, it also when I was choosing where to study economics, it was pretty much the same almost everywhere. Uh, and I didn't have a lot of choice. And we would argue that's wrong. There should be a choice. So I should be able to choose, for example, whether I would become more of a quantitative economist or a qualitative. And this can, of course, also be after the first year. So you give everyone a broad basis. And after that, you let them choose which uh, topics, which skills to focus on. Um, but in practice, that would mean that economists become this broad group that are all focused on studying economic issues and challenges and that they learn. And I think that's also a big uh, thing that we hear from a lot of employers right now, that they are complaining that economists are not being taught to communicate and collaborate, especially also across disciplinary boundaries. So whether they work with, together with lawyers or political scientists or sociologists, they, they should be able to communicate what they have learned about their economic models with people who have not studied them. Um, so, so that's, I think, part of what we are aiming for is that this profession becomes people who are still specialized, can still have something to contribute, but are really also part of this broader field which, which has a broader knowledge. So, so I think... Yeah, yeah, specialists with a shared foundation, you can yeah. say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm very, uh, going back into the kind of history of ideas realm, not economic history, I was very attracted in my learning to two books that I would recommend to our audience. Uh, one was a man named Mason Gaffney, uh, and he and Fred Harrison later joined him, and they wrote a book called The Corruption of Economics. And it was about how Henry George talked about the common good and the market fundamentalists of the time wanted to narrow that down and corrupted economics. And it's a beautiful uh, discussion. Though my favorite book is by a lady uh, from California named Mary Ferner. And the name of her book is Ad Advocacy Versus Objectivity. 
And it's really set in the late 19th century on how the marginal revolution, which you might call scrubbed clean or sanitized economic from institutional detail or human values, and how um, it set us off on a course that uh, formalization took hold of and left us, how do you say, in a place that's perhaps now needs to be readdressed. Um, Eleanor Ostrom won a fantastic, I thought, Nobel Prize. Her work on how the common good or public goods activity is really manifest in society rather than some abstract uh, kind of meta-mathematical architecture. So I, I think there are plenty of what you might call vehicles to work with in the realm that you're putting together. And yet I find it uncomfortable given what you might call the known structure for professors, how to get research grants, how to get tenure, what they can publish and so forth. Something's got to change in that structure. I once went to someone in uh, a major American university and I said, it looks like you guys make a mathematical recipe. You have five star, three star, and one star journals, and you take everything someone's published and weight them by the stars, come up with a number, and there's a certain threshold for tenure. And you know what that, that it was a gentleman, he said to me, he said, that's right. Because we get sued so often in America when we don't give someone tenure, we have to have an objective measure. But but in in the texture, the deliberation, can you imagine sitting around with people like George Akerlof at University of California, Berkeley, and David Card and all these people come from different vantage points, but to act like they got to submit to a number based on a, somebody gaming things, it, it doesn't make sense. And it, it, in other words, it doesn't use all the intelligence that the faculty has in making those judgments. But the customs of what you might call what survives when you're finishing a Ph.D., is your advisor contributing which is what I might call an assisted suicide professionally by nurturing you to do these textured and beautiful things when it won't get accepted in the peer reviewed journals and you won't get a three, a five or a one star? I, I, I worry about these. And as you know, I net with people like Jim Heckman, Lars Hansen, George Akerlof, uh, Angus Deaton have explored, studied and held sessions on the on the role of the control system, the habit system. But on the other side, you've got these young economists. I would like if I'm a join a profession to know how I can succeed. And so the question becomes what? What are the ways in which the profession, the more textured, the more diverse profession that you guys bring together, how does that crystallize? One of the people that I want to encourage you all, if you don't know, uh, he's no longer alive, but Sir Ken Robinson. He's got the most viewed TED Talk of all time. It's called How Schools Kill Creativity. But his talk essentially about preparing the individual in isolation is in contrast to a knowledge intensive service economy. It might have been fit for being on the assembly line in the 19th century, but now work in teams. You go work for a place like Apple, you work in teams. People make different contributions, but it's like you guys were saying, all these different ingredients are necessary to creating what you might call the design. Working in teams is a different process than working individually or being educated and evaluated individually. And and, and I'm, I'm thinking, essentially, you're, when I was reading your book, I kept feeling like you're creating a team sport. It's not about yeah. what the individual guy is or the woman is at a department. It's what the team of the department creates collectively together. And, uh, and that's I, a beautiful I, that's, way to put it. I think it's really. And I think it's a great challenge that you bring. Uh, so let's look at let's look at issues. You've got your team now. They're educated in all these ways. It's not nineteen neoclassical economists all in some narrow methodological constraint, how would they look at finance? How would they look at climate change differently? 
Well, I mean, that, that, that's, that's a very big question. Uh, and I don't know, there's one thing I want to make clear is we, we wrote a book about education in an entire discipline, which is uh, like an insanely broad topic to take on in one book. And we, we don't want to <laughs> extend ourselves into the field of policy because that's, that's just not our contribution, not with this book, maybe later. Um, but of course, we, we can definitely talk about how, how a team like this would approach that's, a that's my problem question. like that. That's, thank you for clarifying. That's my question. I'm not asking you for your policy recommendations. I'm asking you yeah. how this team addresses the challenge as distinct from what we've experienced. Yeah, yeah. And I think, okay, so you mentioned uh, climate change. And I think... One thing there would be, so in, on this team, I imagine you would have neoclassical economists, you would have institutional economists, uh, you might have evolutionary economists, um, you might have some post-Keynesians. Or people who are able to jump between the different perspectives themselves. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and I think these different parts of the team would, would approach uh, the challenge from their own perspective. So, for instance... The neoclassical economists might start to figure out: okay, is there some way we can uh, adjust the market mechanisms on this? You know, so so how about a carbon tax? Is there some, a system in place? Uh, could there be a system in place? An emission uh, trading scheme? Could that work? What are the market incentives at work right now? And and how can we um, how can we put in place policies that make those work towards the common good? Uh, which is and a big contribution. Um, ecological economists, on the other hand, might start working from the what you might call the interface between the economy and the ecology or nature, uh, and start from planetary boundaries. And say, okay, you know, uh, right now the economic system is producing this and this kind of CO2 output, for example. Uh, what what are the planetary boundaries? When will we hit them? And and to what degree do we need a hard stop before then? Which is a question that doesn't really arise in uh, in the neoclassical approach, commonly known as environmental economics rather than ecological economics. Uh, that's about adjusting the markets and changing the market mechanisms, but it assumes you don't put a hard stop somewhere and ecological systems do have breakdown points. So at some point you do need to do that. Then you might have the evolutionary economists who, who look over a longer term at how certain industries develop and how certain in industries adjust and, and who are able to think in a more medium to long term. Okay, so we have, you know, we have this coal and gas industry which is on a certain trajectory, uh, how, how is that rooted in society and what different industries would need to arrive, come up besides it to replace it and how, how could, uh, also looking at historical examples, how could a clean energy industry arise? Because we can't just say from next year we're going to do 50% clean energy. It's got to grow. How does it grow? Uh, and in this way, I think the, the different you might say sub-disciplines of economics or different approaches or schools of thought would have very distinct contributions to to a big three-dimensional, well, more than three-dimensional problem. Yeah, and also in terms of the methods I discussed earlier, and I think also mm -hmm. knowing sort of the history of a sector, knowing the real-world uh, institutions and, and, and sort of details. So I think it would be a mix between, yeah, really technical people, really abstract theoretical thinking, but also people who are perhaps just better at sort of seeing what are the concerns of the different stakeholders and to really connect that to the sort of policy options. And I think I think then it becomes a lot broader than just different methods of different theories. But it, in, as you say, recognizing that just different people on the team have different skills mm -hmm. and learning how to work together. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, uh, how would I say, you can see in the challenge of climate change, people with a different mindset that are quite brilliant, like Naomi Klein, have emerged, looking prescient, looking like she identifies the problem, but 
is daunted because we're not addressing it. And if she were part of the team and the other four people were truly teammates, it might inspire a study. It might inspire a working group that brought this to bear and augmented, complemented with an E, the kind of things that Naomi's vision or pattern recognition put on the table. And what do we do about it? If you brought in Tom Ferguson to that team, you might understand how people in the fossil fuel industry are trying to defend the value of their assets, maybe whole countries like Russia, and their balance of payments and the quality of those lives are at issue and why they might resist these transitions. And so you, you develop what you might call a multi-dimensional, uh, different vantage points, like everybody's looking from a different angle, but as being part of the team. Then you want some guys, men, women, who are excellent with data. You want some people who are excellent with historical analogy. And all of that together could really teach people. One yeah. or another is a, is a valuable contribution, but each is only, say, 20% of the whole pie. And, uh, Man, I like this vision. <laughs> so I think I like, I like uh, you know, how you're seeing, how do you say, a collaborative approach. At some level, if, if things were organized more as teams and less as individuals, I think people would recognize what you might call positive externalities more easily too. The ways in which other people help you, the way in which you can help them becomes part of what we would call your utility function and your preferences. Yeah, actually, this is something we didn't mention yet, but in the book, we also spend some attention on um, not what you teach, but how you teach. Uh, and one thing we suggest, so out of, interviews with uh, employers of fresh graduates comes that collaboration, communication, that these are important skills that are un insufficiently taught. So for example, one exercise you might do with students is, is at, uh, let them represent different sides of an argument and then at some point swap and say, okay, now you represent the other person's argument. So you got to get inside them and really understand them. And in this way, not make it, you know, a battle who's the best arguer who wins, but train people in, yeah, you, you can call it mental jujitsu or something, uh, getting into the different perspectives and, and moving around them. And of course, everyone might have their, their, their personal preference, where they come from and what they represent best. But you got to teach people to, to move through the different mental positions and mental perspectives. That's that's as far as as we're concerned like that's that's the foundation of an academic education maybe in any field oh, I, i don't want to speak broader than economics right now but yeah if you teach an academic education like the the mental flexibility of changing perspective is is the foundation i'd say well back in 2009 when i was exploring the development of inet we decided to do it i was traveling around the world and meeting with people about what they thought was right and wrong in light of the, what you might call a uh, traumatic birth experience of the great financial crisis. One of the things that was recommended to me was a series of multidisciplinary studies run by a Canadian Institute of Advanced Research and another one run by the MacArthur Foundation. And almost all of the economists and many famous names were included I was able to speak to confidentially said I learned so much from being with psychologists and anthropologists and so forth because they kind of got shaken out of the customs the presuppositions and yet they were with minds and imaginations that they respected and the teams evolved and many of these people are you know Nobel laureates or John Bates Clark Award winners in the United States. And the, they, some of the younger ones really got an uplift. They're, they're, how would I say, they had a formative experience, which is almost like a postdoc in teamwork that's multidisciplinary that looks like the path you would set us on. 
I think that's I think it's really uh, encouraging. Now I want to I want to come in to this back. You know, I, I, I talk about what inspired you. There wasn't there was a huge need for what you've done. I that I believe, but there wasn't there but there wasn't a careerist market for it. So there's another ingredient in this, which comes from something that inspires you, but is manifest as courage. Where did you guys get the courage to go do this <laughs> with your time at this stage in your career in life? Yeah, wow. Good question. Um, there, there are definitely moments where I also switch from the feeling, are we just being arrogant right now? Uh, yeah. Trying to create an overview of the whole field. I just graduated myself. Is this courage or is this arrogance? That question was sometimes definitely on, on my mind. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> well, I'll, say, I'll just say one thing. When people think Rome is burning, it's not arrogant to pick up a fire hose. <laughs> There's a whole lot of sense that things are out of balance. But nonetheless, you're leaping outside of the conduits of the institutional structure. And you're innovating, you're catalyzing understanding that's in the literature, your catalog in your book, you're catalyzing the understanding you have from being in groups like Rethinking Economics or the INET Young Scholars Initiative, and you're bringing that to the surface. And that's courage. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. thanks. Uh, I think for me personally, I think the last point of being part of a movement, at least for me, did a lot. Yeah. Uh, in my first year, I was talking to some classmates, but they were all like, uh, yeah, shut your mouth. The professor is right. You're wrong. Uh, he knows best. So, so, so don't ask these critical questions. And, and that was really making me, yeah, quite, quite insecure and, and, and feeling not confident at all to do anything. Um, then after a year, I met Joris and the rest of the rethinking economics groups in the Netherlands. And for me, that was sort of enabling me, at least as a person to, to sort of step to become more confident and also enjoy the process of, of yeah, often it is also sort of can be can be tough. Uh, it can be a fight and, and you get some setbacks or you get in an argument and, and sometimes you, you, yeah, you don't do it right. And but then because you're part of a team, uh, I think back coming back to the <laughs> I guess the, the, the yeah, topic we, we, we are discussing all the time that that really helps me at least to, to do this whole process. And then it yeah, it feels more like a joy and a hobby. That, that becomes a bit uh, out of hand and becomes your work, but uh, <laughs> yeah, but doing it alone wouldn't have been an option for me at least. No, but let, let, let's talk about that in a world of pervasive externalities, plus both positive and negative. You got nourished, as I'm listening, it by your comrades, by your colleagues, and by fellow students who shared concern. You guys hit the accelerator and you went for it to give to that process. A beacon, yeah, a leadership, uh, a North Star to inspire the evolution. It'll take courage to hear the critiques and the refutation, but you step up to that. And there's nothing wrong with learning after you've offered something. But the courage to offer something, you did. I applaud but I'm hearing you say you were nourished by the notion of doing that for those people who had nourished you. That feels more like a world that has common good and has positive externalities than one where everybody just keeps score with the market. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think on both sides, so let's say bottom up this, this student movement, Rethinking economics uh, and and its predecessors, but rethinking economics is the one we really uh, grew up in. You might say uh, has has a, a small dedicated staff team and a, and a lot of volunteers who've been organizing meetings all around Europe and and in the rest of the world increasingly. And I think these meetings provided a giant inspiration for us and and the impetus to to do this. And from the start, we drew a lot from that group. Uh, so we kicked off the off the the writing process with a, a long weekend with people from seven different countries gathered in the Netherlands. Um, and throughout the process, we've been drawing on that. And on the other side, like 
so you can you can you can honestly say that we were both dissatisfied with our education and at the same time uh, we had dedicated professors who 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 like you you could tell that this this is this is their passion and and even if we are missing important things in in our education you know they 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 put across the skills and the knowledge that they have to offer with a passion and 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 are really open to 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 rethink that if something else serves better by now and we i mean not not all certainly but uh, i i know a lot of professors a lot of the people who taught me who are really open to that yep. and and yet we're scrambling for materials and knowing through the rethinking international network of all the good textbooks that were coming out, bringing together a pluralism of ideas, bringing real world knowledge and so on, knowing that all this material is out there and that uh, established academic staff members, you know, often don't have a good way to find it and, and bring it together into courses. Or don't have the time to. Yeah, don't have the time because they're pressed in, in the, you know, the publish or perish rat race. Yeah, I don't know. I think that also helped give us the courage to 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 put on big shoes. Yes. Well, in my exploration, I mentioned some of the formative people: Charles Kindleberger, Axel Leinhoff, uh, a man named David Abraham, who wrote a lot of economic history of Weimar Germany. Uh, subsequently, left the academic profession. Uh, Tom Ferguson. All kinds of people contributed. So did people like Alan Blinder and Joe Stiglitz, who sit within the profession. But what I'm really, I'm celebrating today, listening to you, is that I can find those beacons. I can find people like we've mentioned, David Collender. I read studies that he and Bob Solo co-chaired, which said, when you survey people that want to do a graduate work in economics, what do they say? 80, I think it was 84% said you got to be good at math and statistics. Only 11% said you have to know anything about the real world. And so all of these facets, all of these dimensions, all of the illumination and some of the guidance from rebel elders that I've gotten is now coming into interface with the younger generation that's rising up and taking the lead, and that's you guys.